come to our second panel. I thought I found the first panel about remaking futures, remaking digital futures, really thought provoking. And it's going to be a hard follow up, I think. Uh, but uh, we are actually uh, with this panel for informing our audiences as well. We would like to bring an example about about the future in the remaking. And this is the future of our mobile, of our wireless networks. So I know actually that quite a lot of us, we have not even experienced 5G yet. Uh, so it's being introduced quite widely right now, but actually around the world, uh, academics, industry, government, they start actually that 6G journey. And I think it's a time now to, 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 to pose the questions, you know, just following that premise and thinking within BDFI, do we need to innovate dif differently for our future of mobile networks? And if yes, why and how? And I think we are going to be taking this discussion in this panel. Uh, just give an example, put our thoughts forward with actually one technology, digital technology domain. So the title of our panel is 60 Futures, and the provocation question is future mobile, is future mobile network connectivity a human need or a human right? Uh, depends what we are going to get, how wh where we are going to get, you know, into this panel. But I um, really feel privileged to, to actually be joined by three distinguished colleagues. And the first is Dr. Howard Ben. Howard has been in the telecom industry probably as far as long as I have been, starting working in the 80s on radio systems, on uh, GSM in the 90s, and then every single generation of mobile networks. So Howard currently is Vice President Communication Research for Samsung R&D Institute in the UK. He's actually one of the people that they're leading the discussion around 6G in the UK and internationally, and not only leading a dialogue, but also leading standards. So Howard, uh, you, you may take the you may go ahead with your statement. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. First of all, it's a privilege to uh, to be here attending the event, and uh, I, I'm really enjoying reading the chat as we're going along, especially from the last session. So, yes, as Dimitri said, uh, I, I'm one of the, uh, the lucky few who just happened to be in the right place at the right time many years ago, uh, helping create the future in the past, um, working on GSM. When we started on GSM back in 1992, it was a luxury good. It was something that uh, well-off people or high-up business people could use to make a phone call. It was, it was quite simple. Uh, technology was, was really interesting, developing it. I don't think we knew what the future looked like at that stage. Now, of course, things have changed dramatically over the uh, all those many years. We're now at the stage where within the uh, the government's diversification task force that Demetra sat on. So there was some interesting discussions there about how our infrastructure has changed now to become critical infrastructure. So no longer are we talking about something that is nice to have. It is part of our economy in the UK. It's part of our social structures in the UK. So why is it critical? Well, just look at all those new businesses that didn't exist. Now, I think this is where it's great having the social sciences uh, interacting with the technology because we have changed the way that society works. So if we take something simple like ordering a taxi, uh, we changed the taxi industry by the fact that people had phones that had location in them. We could see where our taxi was uh, and it enabled new businesses, food delivery, e-commerce, mapping, all of those things that we use today that we take for granted didn't exist 15 years ago. And that has changed society because the gig economy uh, would not be there if we didn't have these low cost really effective mobile phones that could provide all the information needed. We're replacing our emergency services network 
uh, with a, a 4G based solution. So our police, fire brigade and ambulances, they're having their Tetra network turned off. Uh, it's taken quite a long time, but we're getting very close now. So that really is critical infrastructure. Smart meters, uh, we've already heard from the government recently that we can't turn off the old technology until at least 2033. That's a long time away. And one of the reasons for that is because our smart meters are connecting to the old technology, not to the new technologies. So I think it has really got to a stage now where the critical infrastructure has become a right. You know, and that has implications. We already have um, the shared rural network in the UK. That is where we have remote locations without good coverage and the government are paying to have infrastructure put in. It's a joint deal between the operators and the government. We have security, which is obviously uh, critical for the networks. Even 2G, which does have some uh, slight little kind of security issues in that you can have false base stations in the network. There isn't what we call two-way authentication. It's never been hacked. Uh, so the phone hacking scandal that we often read about in the newspapers, of course, they didn't hack the phones, they hacked the voicemail system of the operator. So we had this super secure system, 3G got more secure, 4G, 5G are the most secure systems ever uh, rolled out in the world. They are super, super, super secure. But I think this is where kind of the role of kind of social science comes in with technology and looking at the future, because when we start looking at that requirement for security and then we look at the way people use their phones, then there are implications to things like power consumption. The green agenda is massive. We have to reduce power consumption. If we're encrypting everything two or three times through the network for my kids like the uh, the, the well-known app where you can sweep through many videos very quickly. That's just kind of stuff that shouldn't really need to be encrypted twice in a network. You know, the, how do we start addressing some of the way that people use these systems, the, the human centric networking in the future? And just finally, before I close, I just have to give a little plug for uh, for another digital institute. Of course, this isn't the uh, the first of the Futures Institute. So uh, I also uh, sit on the uh, or I chair the board of the advisory panel of the Brunel Digital Futures uh, Center as well. So I, I'm hoping that we can see a lot of interaction with uh, other universities across in the UK. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. Thank you very much. And uh, we welcome national collaboration. So we take this, the collaboration with Brunel after this panel and see how we can make it happen. Um, our second panelist is Professor Peter Williamson. Peter comes with a different background. So Peter actually is a professor of international management and the University of Cambridge Just Business School and a fellow of Jesus College. So he comes with some background in Mary Lynn's and Boston Consulting Group. And he has been quite prolific on writing books uh, on his research topics, which are actually around cover globalization strategy and ecosystem innovation. I met Peter recently because he commissioned some work through his center, who's which was looking at governance issues for 5G and then 6G systems. So, Peter. Thank you very much, Dimitra, for inviting me. Uh, as you say, I come from a bit different perspective than the technology or perhaps even sociology one. And I'd like to follow on from Howard to focus a little bit on the implications of the applications that 6G will enable. And let me start by, by just saying what those are. I, firstly, I think much greater use of artificial intelligence and machine to machine communication without human intervention. Uh, the growth of virtual and reality worlds, uh, including holog holographics and, and digital twins. I think very important, something I'll come back to in a moment, is that we're not just going to see the network collecting personal data, but actually processing that in real time and making responses, if not decisions, based on it. And I think that 
creates quite a lot of issues for people's rights. Uh, and finally, um, new advances in, uh, in cyber security, uh, possibly involving digital ledgers. So I think those technologies which are going to be enabled by uh, 6G, and there might be others, raise quite a lot of important issues about rights and the interface between technology and society. And the first of those, which won't come as a surprise to you, probably given that I'm a professor of international management, is how we maintain global flows of data and not only maintain the flows, but maintain trust in the validity of, of those data and the uh, security of those things. And, and I, I think that's very important because what you see happening now is that we gained enormously from common standards globally. Uh, a lot of economic and, and user benefits from that. Uh, and now what we're seeing is a lot of pressures for frag fragmentation, geopolitical pressures that are saying, well, you can only store data in certain locations. You, you can't move certain types of data across borders. And, it, you know, if this, if, if this, is going to be central to our lives in the future and, and therefore global technology uh, and interconnectivity becomes a, a right, then I think this frag fragmentation problem is very worrying. Uh, and therefore we need to find ways to uh, address that. I think the, the, the second thing, of course, that rises from this is the whole question of data privacy and control. And as I mentioned, it's not just going to be control of what data is collected and stored, but how do you control the real time interaction and use of that data uh, as you're going about your daily life. So I think that that raises quite a lot of other important issues. Um, and that leads on to the, the next one, which is the issue of personal and human control over AI and, and its activities. So how do we deal with AI making decisions about our lives, some which might be potentially life-changing decisions to us with no human interaction uh, and perhaps the inability to explain why the algorithms have decided what they've decided, because many of these generalized AI technologies which 6G will enable are, are actually error correction learning systems, and therefore you can't explain why they've made the decisions that they've made. They just found a pattern and, and they've gone ahead with it. Um, so I think this, this uh, area of, of how do we control this, this interaction, so there's the the global flows and maintaining trust and security and in global flows and allowing those global flows to happen. There's the privacy and control over the way that data is used interactively. There's the, uh, the control over these AI programs uh, and, and how do uh, we maintain personal and human control over those. So I think there are some of the main issues that arise uh, we'll probably come back later in the panel to what we might do about them, <laughs> but that arise from the, the new technologies that uh, 6G is going to enable, or at least enable to become ubiquitous uh, in our lives. And I think they do affect a lot of people's rights uh, as to what is, what is happening. So I'll, I'll leave it there. There's uh, other issues we might come back to, things like inclusion, or as Howard mentioned also, the, the big issue of the um, energy usage and the climate impacts, but uh, uh, that's, that's for later. And uh, so I'll leave it there with those uh, thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And our last panelist, Professor Simon Saunders. Simon has done it almost all. Uh, starting from uh, being, uh, you know, founder in SMEs, founding the small cells, a forum working in senior positions within Google, most lately having uh, the position of director of emerging and online technologies with Ofcom. 
I'm very proud to say that actually Simon has been appointed as an honorary professor at University of Bristol very recently and also is a visiting professor at King's. So you are having a lot of insights on the topic to, to share, Simon. Well, I hope so, Dimitra, and I, I hope I haven't done it all just yet. Um, but um, I mean, as Dimitra's sort of indicated, I am a, an unashamed technologist in the communication sphere, but I've uh, always tried to do that with an eye for what it, it means for society. And actually, one of my um, productive collaborations with Dimitra and the group at, at Bristol was um, in the context of using technology to promote well-being, where we we organized the world's first 5G music lesson with, with Jamie Cullum as part of some work I did with a, a charity called Music for All. Um, and Dimitra asked me to, to talk a little bit about sort of regulation and policy uh, issues um, here. Now I'm conscious that saying you're gonna talk about regulation is probably a good recipe for having people fall asleep. But what I will do is, is give a bit of a sort of uh, wish list of, of things that I think it is important for regulators and policymakers to be thinking about in this space. Um, and I'd note one of the, the comments in the chat said, we need more critique and less cheerleading for digitalization. And I think there's something to be said for that, you know, as, as those in, in the industry, there is a risk that we talk about the newest and the latest and the greatest things uh, as if they were unequivocally good things. And we need to apply a, a societal uh, filter to that. And I think, you know, having BDFI as a source of expertise on that is fantastic. Um, on this question of mobile connectivity, you know, whether it's a human need or a human right, funnily enough, I attended a, a gig by the comedian Ben Elton recently, and funnily enough, he addressed this, this question. Um, I'm afraid I can't do justice to his comments um, in, with the, the right level of impact because of the, the number of expletives that are involved. But suffice it to say that his, his general point was, was honestly what a ridiculously entitled society we must have become if we think that access to shiny 5G smartphones should be a human right. Um, but I mean, having said that, clearly wireless and mobile connectivity has become important in our lives and Howard's given some great examples of how they've, they've made things happen that, that create jobs for people and create uh, a lot of benefits. And Peter's given some great examples of how that could continue into the, the longer term future. Um, and some of this really becomes self-fulfilling in terms of our need to access these things. For example, when governments make access to public services conditional on our access to mobile and other online platforms, and that really embeds the situation. But, but that doesn't make it a human right. And I think we should be cautious at overloading that term, particularly, frankly, at a time when, when human rights and protections face challenges and face erosion in various environments. And I think there's a risk of somewhat devaluing the, the fundamental nature of human rights. But it's certainly a need. And in, in delivering on that need, we should be, be careful about, about the diversity. Um, the UK has a, a, a actually a very high percentage of devices which sit in drawers or in glove compartments, generating very little value for the operators involved but huge societal value in keeping people safe and connected to people when they need to be. And, and those devices and needs of those sorts of people are often not considered well in this, this domain. We, we do need to ensure therefore that, that the networks that deliver these services are viable and are invested in for the long term. Recognizing that most users would, would value, you know, incremental improvements in coverage, availability, reliability, far higher than incremental leaps in speed or even new services, just having really solid access to the things that they do need. Um, to ensure that, that, there's often a tendency for people to start talking about this like a, a utility or a public service, perhaps in the way that water or electricity might be, and even, even to talk about wholesale networks and perhaps even nationalization. And, and frankly, any, any thought like that fills me with horror. Not, not because it isn't a good idea to make to share things where it's helpful to share them uh, and to build for resilience and for security and for the long term, but because this is an environment where innovation and rates of change matter and where the types of needs from these networks are really very diverse. So I think you know models from the, the railways or the 
that energy utilities really aren't a good proxy for something you might do when evolving the future of mobile networks. Um, and indeed, at the same time as, as kind of consolidating and ensuring a long term future for this critical infrastructure, we're also seeing the, the outpouring of a whole range of innovation as, as more private and localized and specialized networks are coming along. So, so we should really be careful to, to design at both ends of that. There's also a risk, I think, that in an event like this, we're, we're sitting in a very kind of rarefied bubble um, and, and far from these services being universally accepted as a, as a need, let alone a right, some question that, you know, the very value and the safety of these systems. Some of it's fueled by misinformation and disinformation, like the, the arson attacks we've seen on 5G masts. And often this, this misinformation differentially affects diverse and marginalized segments of society. And we need much better work on the public understanding of science and technology to address that. Um, some of it's driven by, you know, by genuine needs. Like, you know, if you're if you're not able to afford food or very topically fuel, I'd suggest that you know, 5G mobile connectivity may not be the most important thing for you. Um, and a big segment of society still can't afford access to these services, even though kind of average prices relative to income in a place like the UK is actually very affordable. You know, there's a big segment of society that's not the case for. And then kind of finally, and, and sort of relevant to some of the things that Peter said, there are real challenges for online safety, notably the expectations of young people um, and access to harmful content. Um, at Ofcom, I created the online technology team there charged with supporting their new role as the regulator for online safety. And, and there is actually scope and need for technology to be part of the, the solution there, given the scale of the the content uh, involved that needs to be be looked after. Um, and, you know, in passing, I'd say I'm, I'm much more concerned not about the, the big tech platforms there who will fall into line in regulation, but about sort of niche platforms with an active interest in spreading harmful content, often under a bit of a, a false flag of, of freedom of expression. And, you know, we can all relate to the need to disconnect from technology as well as to connect to it when the time uh, you know, exceeds what's, what's healthy for us. So just, just in summary, I think you know, we do need to ensure investment horizons for scale networks, but we need to do that while continuing the competition and innovation in both technology and business models at the infrastructure level. You know, we do need to cater for the wide range of consumers and citizens, not just typical or tech inclined ones. We need to address mis and disinformation. We need to address digital inclusion and literacy and wider online safety questions. So I would think less about rights and more about ensuring fertile ground for everybody, but with some backstop protections for those that might otherwise be excluded. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Simon. So the jury is still out. Uh, if it is a need or a right, quite rightly so. Uh, however, I have heard the words utility, I heard the words critical infrastructure. We all discuss about risks around privacy, trust and geopolitics. And geopolitics is quite an important consideration like now when we are talking about our future of connectivity, our future of our networks. So for me, I'm going to modify my second question a bit. And the modification is, do we need to do anything now? I mean, obviously there is a change happening and there is a change happening towards this next generation of our mobile connectivity for a number of reasons. But does this really need to happen and why? So this is a, a different spin following um, Simon's statement, actually. And I would like to, to start with Peter on that. Thank you. Well, I, I do think we need to do something about it now, because if I can pick up on the geopolitics, it's, it's happening. So uh, the, the fragmentation is already underway. Uh, and you can all remember, of course, the days when when you went to the United States, you couldn't 
use your European phone there without <laughs> a different phone or a different <laughs> uh, dual uh, purpose. Well, imagine if, if you were traveling overseas now and the, the regulations said you can't access the data you have at home because we're not allowing that data to flow into our country or uh, we've forced it to be stored in some place that's not accessible. So I, I think we do need to do something about it. And, and um, the first thing we probably do need to do about it is to actually track what's happening. So uh, Dimitri, you say a lot is happening, but and I'm sure it is, but we don't really know what is happening, I think, in an overview sense. And, and, and maybe we'll come back to this later, but I'm wondering whether or not we need to create something like the International Panel on Climate Change just to pull the facts together about who's doing what and, and what is happening uh, with fragmentation of, of data flows and technologies uh, throughout the world. So. Uh, that that would be my reason for wanting to to move now. Peter, so how or what is happening? To answer Peter's question, actually, what exactly is happening right now, and are we doing things the right way? Lots, lots, and lots, and lots are going on. So let's start with the world of mobile communications. We are already starting the process of six G. Now I know it's kind of a frightening prospect to uh, to a lot of people that uh, most people haven't even got their five G phones yet, let alone six G. It won't happen until twenty thirty. So we still have time. Uh, there's still plenty of time to work out where we where we're going but those requirements are starting to get written right now so the itu have got their time uh, frame in place uh, 3gpp who develop all the technology won't get going for another few years yet but the fundamental research is obviously going on in labs like demetrius in bristol uh, as well as across the globe so you know this is a global activity the reason why it takes so long is that these are extremely complex technologies. I mean, it's difficult to explain the complexity. All I can say is that even 5G, there are uh, over a million pages of specification. So if you start looking at all of the specs, you know, a lot of that is kind of machine generated stuff. But there's just like endless uh, reams of complexity within these networks. What's also interesting, though, I think, is the world of the Internet and AI is beginning to change, too. So um, Samsung have an AI research center in Cambridge, and one of the things that we're looking at there is explainable AI for exactly the reason that Peter said, is that if you can't explain why a decision is being made, you're in a very poor position to be able to rectify anything that you see is not quite right without retraining the whole model. So... Um, a lot going on uh, and I think just having this social input into these discussions is going to be critical in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Howard. So it seems to me, Simon, that if we don't do, even if we don't do anything, things are going to happen. I mean, we cannot stop this. I know that when we were doing 5G, we said this absolutely going to be the last G. And I was out in stages saying this, I'm never going to put another number in front of a G. And I think you've done the same mistake, uh, but it is going to happen. So what do we do next? I mean, what kind of action we need to take in order actually to make, to drive this, as you said, for well-being, for the kind of principles that we are setting and really just uh, try to influence innovation and regulation. Yeah. No, I mean, I think I think there are plenty of things that need to be done. I think I think a mistake that we could collectively make is to try and um, try and, and design for one model, try, try and push everything in the same direction. So so, you know, there is a, a requirement for protecting access to critical national infrastructure. It's a really important one. There's a lot of thinking for that. But, but it's really not the only thing. And I think if you create that as the model for all the deployment of public wireless infrastructure, then you'll miss out on a lot of benefits. You'll 
not create the, the, the innovation that is actually useful um, and so on. So, you know, very much kind of vive la difference in, in that kind of, of thinking. I'd also say it's, you know, it's not only that these systems are useful for society, but also we learn about society through these systems. I'm actually working with a company at the moment that's equipping, equipping um, Uber drivers and Deliveroo riders with with test devices so they can understand you know, how, how mobiles are performing. And that yields fantastic data, appropriately anonymized and aggregated, about the way society works, about our traffic flows, about our habits and so on. So we, we can learn more about the world through doing that. So it's actually the, the inverse of Howard's point that mobile enables the gig economy. We can actually use the gig economy to enable a better understanding of mobile at the same time. Simon, uh, uh, just just a question to to Peter. Uh, if we are actually do things differently, if we don't focus to classical business models of mobile network operators or vendors, do you see that actually the current international business ecosystem is going to has it has an opportunity to adopt, you know, a new way of innovating, a new way of commercializing? Or actually, these ideas are going to be stopped, you know, because <laughs> of the way that the industry is structured at the moment, and the, the, the actually the market is structured at the moment. Yes, very good question, the beach. So, so I think the uh, we need to do it, but whether or not it's going to happen, I'm not sure, because the ecosystem as we move through 5G and 6G is becoming a lot more diverse and complex and possibly the role of the telcos in as the kind of gatekeepers and central point might go away because there's a lot of different industries and other organizations coming into this uh, and also creating this machine to machine interaction and so um, I don't think that we necessarily have the ways of communicating with these new participants in the ecosystem very well. I, there's a very well developed um, interaction and governance process on standards between the mobile operators and the regulators and, and the other people involved in that core technology. But we don't have a very good governance mechanism to bring standards and processes to facilitate all this with this much wider and diverse ecosystem of, of industries and individuals and organizations uh, around the world. So, so I, I, I'm not uh, confident that the governance won't act as a constraint to to innovation uh, in, or at least getting the benefits of the innovation out in the right way for, for people. So th thank you, Peter. And then a follow up for anybody that would like to take it. It is something that we're getting through our questions in the chat. Do you see an opportunity of changing the ownership of internet or network infrastructure to a more open cooperative model? Is there an opportunity there? I mean, yeah. Simon. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think there is an opportunity, but I think I think that the question sort of might betray a bit of a lack of understanding of how the internet does actually work. You know, it is already a network of networks, with with all of us having the ability to build small parts of you know small networks using internet technology, which don't relate to the wider internet or to interconnect those extremely simply. And that's, you know, that's kind of the fundamental magic of the internet. Now that, that sort of um, heterogeneous ownership and, and design hasn't made its way to mobile networks in, to the same degree, to anything like the same degree yet. Um, we've seen it in Wi-Fi, so we know it can work in wireless technology. Um, but I think, you know, relevant to what Peter was just saying about, you know, a wider range of entities being involved, I think, some of this, frankly, is is regulators getting out of the way of that innovation um, that I think, you know, for example, in steps like shared spectrum and dynamic spectrum, which have hitherto been one of the barriers 
to that kind of innovation that is starting to free up but but still at really quite a small scale and i think we've only you know barely scratched the surface of the potential there and there's you know there are so many good technologies for making better use of what was seen as a scarce resource before and i mean i've got a software defined radio at the end of my of my uh, desk here which i've turned into a 4g uh, base station you know it, it's amazing how low the barriers to entry are for experimenting now compared to what they were 10 or 20 years ago so i think you know allowing wireless technologies to be a f to be fully a part of that that internet um innovation ecosystem both in terms of technology and business models is is still unfinished business fantastic howard would you like to comment on this or you're covered no, I'd I just like to, to add to Simon's comments. I, I think there, there is a massive misunderstanding on how the internet works. I mean, I, I sit on uh, one of the technical committees on ICANN. Uh, ICANN are the guys that uh, look after the internet naming. So when you see a .com or a .org and there's names, uh, that, that's basically the organization that looks after that. There's lots and lots of discussion about the way that the internet is evolving over time. But as Simon said, what most people miss out on is the fact that it is a, uh, it seemed to be a, a, you know, you talk to a, a large um, a internet company, to a, to a Google or, you know, one of these other large companies. But of course you can set stuff up yourself if you're technically able to do it. So I run a Minecraft server for my kids at home that's connected over a very secure VPN uh, certificate based so you can have these networks that they're, they're not the simplest of things to set up i totally agree uh, but you already can have local community networks if you want to set those up no thank you thank you all for your comments i have one last question i would like us to imagine or i would like you to imagine so each of you has two minutes and uh, we are now in 2030, you know, and we have, you know, quite well evolved mobile networks or internet may not be exactly 6G, but it's going to be close. We are going to be, be moving in the future. How do you think that person to person connectivity is going to look like in the longer term? What is your vision of the future? And I would like to start with Peter here always dangerous to do this <laughs> but, uh, I, a, a few things to say firstly i think that as simon intimated the the mobile telecoms networks are going to look more like the internet in terms of openness in in some way um i don't know exactly how that's going to happen and i do think that creates great opportunities as well as some real problems because we know some of the problems that come with the openness of the, the internet. So that's part of what I see happening, um, moving from a very kind of well-controlled that goes through a single switch to something that's, that's much more open and, and diverse. Um, I see a world which you might or might not like with sensors everywhere, um, with, with AI making uh, decisions that don't involve humans and I hope with maintenance of global connectivity but I fear that we are going to see at least some degree of fragmentation and so the ability to connect these networks that are, that are sprouting up uh around the world and with each other might might be constrained by our inability to um have the right policy to to both facilitate this but also um, manage some of the problems with it thank you simon i mean since you talked about person-to-person -person communication in particular i think i mean i think in terms of making the glass go away is a way of saying it. there's lots of chatter about you know holography and metaverses and so on but i think I think the, the, the key here is about making people, giving people the opportunity to communicate in a natural way, whatever that involves. 
Um, and you, Demetra, and others have been talking for some years now about the internet of skills, being able to bring your expertise or your knowledge or your, I don't know, comedy stand-up routine to a wider range of, of people. Um, I, I Reluctantly, I don't think 5G is going to achieve that vision. I think, I think we're going to need to go further, not because the, the technology isn't there, but because 5G is being built out in a very, very traditional fashion, frankly. And I think we're going to need, you know, the wider range of players that we've talked about for that. So, you know, I'd like to be able to, you know, spread the goodness of music to a wider range of people, including people actually playing together without having to set up specialist facilities or, or advise people to switch off their Wi-Fi, just because it's natural to do so and easy to do so. And I think going from the sort of bleeding edge technology to something that we genuinely all get straightforward human communication from is easy to say, but I think it's, you know, it's still a, a decade or two out from us actually making that pervasive and useful. Uh, thank you very much, Sa Simon. So you are last, Howard. So I'll ask you the same question. Plus, there is a, an actual question from the audience, which reflects to your own business, a Samsung. So for this case, you can answer a Samsung. Is that do you actually see in the future a citizen without a smartphone? But you can put that in your narrative about the future. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm forever the optimist. So I, I am hoping that by the time we get to 2030, that our phones are going to be lasting a week before we have to recharge them, not because we're putting ever increasingly bigger batteries in them, but because the power consumption used by the phone just drops and drops and drops. We talk to base stations uh, and, and, and infrastructure, which is carbon neutral, which we are using, uh, whether that be solar panels or wind energy, actually on the base station. So we haven't got transmission losses in the network. We've got hyper efficient fiber optic networks. So we've got to move to a stage where we make this all sustainable. There is no doubt that that is going to be the biggest challenge that we face. We talk about, you know, kind of providing coverage and we talk about providing increased data rates and reduced latency. Uh, we can, we know we can do all that stuff. You know, that's kind of just day work for us. Making it all carbon neutral, I think is going to be challenging, but also vitally, vitally important. Um, sorry, so what was the question on the... I, I, I lost track of the, the chat listening to Simon. The question, the specific question is again, looking at the future, can you be a citizen without a smartphone? Uh, probably not. <laughs> right, that was a short answer. And with this, I would like to enormously thank you for this really very interesting discussion. Of course, we didn't agree on the central provocation, but that's okay. That's what I was expecting. This is a conversation that we need actually to develop further. There are a lot of questions in the chat, which of course as involved in the conversation it was very difficult to address. I will ask for these questions actually to be collected and then see how between ourselves we provide some uh, comments. I wouldn't say answers because there are no answers in many of these questions. So at least our your own your own not mine but your own expert comments so thank you very much and uh, i really enjoyed it